Ooh, ah, here. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, today we're going to be talking about understanding collection maintenance concepts. What is collection maintenance and why do we do it? Um, we're going to have everybody starting on uh, developing a draft plan for collection maintenance at your library, whether you're starting from scratch or whether maybe what you're doing isn't quite working as well as you want it to. Hopefully we can give you some ideas to, to get get going again and get everybody on board because that's really important too. Um, and training is also a really important part of collection maintenance. So we want to help you identify your library's training needs and get, get some ideas on how to meet those needs. So we, uh, we took a look at the polls earlier and we just wanted to get an idea of who is here. Uh, so it looks like we have mostly public libraries with a few academic and special and we're very curious about what that other is. If you want to chime in and let us know where you are, other. Um, and a really wide range of sizes of libraries too. So uh, obviously we're at the Denver Public Library. We have a very large service population, um, but hopefully what we're going to talk about can be scaled to whatever whatever type of library that you might have. Um, and it looks like most of you have some sort of system for weeding in place, and that's awesome. Uh, so hopefully you can share some of your best practices with us as we go through this. Um, and we'll, we'll see what's next. So thank you for answering the polls. So we're also curious about um, who has a floating collection? If you want to raise your hand if you have a floating collection, we'd like to just see if that's uh, something that people are dealing with. And to raise your hand, raise your hand um, in the upper, upper left hand, hand scorn, corner, of corner of the screen, there is um, a little man with his hand raised. We have a floating collection, so I just raised my hand. So maybe that's not something folks are dealing with, or maybe the, the hand raising is a little confusing, but we just wanted to check in on that. Uh, what do we mean by a floating collection? Um, so in Denver, we have 26 locations. Um, and it used to be that, um, the collections stayed wherever they were assigned when they, uh, when the books were first bought. Uh, but about four or five years ago, we moved to a floating collection, meaning that wherever things are checked in, that is where they stay, unless um, unless there's a hold on them. So uh, collections start to reflect neighborhoods, and we found that we really had to change our collection maintenance approach when we started floating because all of a sudden whatever was in the building could be could be changing on a daily basis it wasn't just about you know the collection that we own in our building it was about the whole collection uh, the giant system so that uh, that's what really made us start concentrating on collection maintenance <laughs> so pre-floating as I was just saying we Everybody was pretty autonomous in what they were doing uh, at their own locations. They had their own standards. They ran their own reports, or or possibly not. Uh, it was it was kind of a free for all. Um, with the culture shift with floating, we we decided that we needed to really coordinate system wide. So we we gathered a small team of people to look at options and figure out what are, what are we going to do here? What how are we going to make this work for? everybody, big branches, small branches, uh, places that get a lot of returns but don't get a lot of checkouts. Uh, so there were a lot of things that we had to look at. So we eventually decided that we needed to form a team with representation from every branch and department in the system so that we could all talk about common issues. Let's see. So eventually we came up with a monthly weeding calendar 
which contained uh, information about what collections we should weed each month. So everybody was doing the same collection each month, which really helped me in collection development because if I knew the 500s are being weeded, um, I knew I'd be hearing a lot about what 500s we needed enhancements on and not just um, scattershot from, you know, some people in January, some people in July. So it was nice to have that concentrated information. Um, we also really had to crack down on things like local stickering because some branches had their own little sections that they put like yellow dots on or red dots on. And when they showed up in other locations, nobody quite knew what to do with those. <laughs> So that's something that we really had to had to look at as well. Um, we had to develop really detail, detailed guidelines for non-conditional weeding. Um, what does it mean when a book is outdated for sections like the, the law books, the health books, um, science, technology? And we had to figure out a communication plan. Uh, so we ended up with a Google group, um, as well as sharing notes with our managers, um, just so they would know what we're doing, keep them on the radar. And we developed a subgroup that we call the CM Buddies, the Collection Maintenance Buddies, because I quickly realized that I couldn't do it all alone and I needed people to help me, um, people, people really on the ground to help with reports, help with questions from people who are doing weeding every day. <laughs> Uh, so this is Monica, uh, so this is Monica, Monica and, and I'm going to tell you about Monica, uh, Denver Public Library's on. system of collection Monica, maintenance. Monica, if I could interrupt one second, we're getting a little bit of feedback. I think if I have one of you mute your um, your not your not your mic, but your speakers, then only sound through one computer will come through. Does that make right, sense? We've got it. Yep. So. Um, although weeding isn't everything about collection maintenance, it's a pretty huge part of it. And we've found over time that it's really difficult for people to cope with their feelings about weeding. Deleting books, throwing away books is really difficult, especially for librarians, because we love books, which is how we ended up here for the most part. We decided it was best to come up with a process for helping people cope with those feelings and then weeding and collection maintenance in general. Um, so I'm going to kind of start by talking about our philosophy and then how we help teach staff to weed. So one of the shelvers at the branch that I work at, Park Hill, said she, um, after reading The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo, said that if she silently acknowledges each worn-out book for its service before she disposes of it, she could weed like crazy. Let them go with gratitude. Um, so Marie Kondo kind of says that even items that we find are not useful for us, books that have never circulated, um, we can thank them for showing what doesn't work for our collection. And we can thank them for what they've done for us. And that helped her a lot. So how do you guys get started weeding and how do you convince your reluctant weeders? Got some uh, chat boxes up in the middle of the screen for people to, to kind of weigh in with your ideas. So in terms of getting started with weeding, uh, Dina was saying looking at circulation stats is a good place to start. And Dina also has no reluctant uh, weeders, so she might win the prize for today. I was a really bad weeder in my day. <laughs> uh, usage reports, um, how, what's circled over the past couple of years, the condition of books, looking at the ugly. Um, Debbie says that they run reports based on a schedule, what's in the subject area. what's not checked out for five years, outdated information, anything that might be misleading, etc. Analyzing the co collection, the space allocated, order numbers, 
our students looking at an accurate information. Uh, staff label copies, good, bad, and ugly. That could be like a fun pastime. Uh, do conditional first to get rid of anything that's um, slipped past us. These are all great ideas. What I can do is I can um, uh, kind of gather these ideas and strip out everybody's names and get these posted to the CSL and Session website also. In terms of reluctant read, uh, not read readers, um, <laughs> I like Jamie makes a good point. There are over a million books published each year, and you need to let go of the old to make room for the new. Make sure you have a point person at each branch who's enthusiastic about reading, showing the stats. Your patrons are worth the, be worth the best you can give, not the adequate. You guys are great. These are awesome. And Christine says that it's her biggest issue, that usually she does a lot of the weeding, um, and she tries to clearly explain and give detailed guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jenny. Hoarding could be a collection management policy. <laughs> We have, we have some funny people on today. <laughs> this is great. And Deborah's saying that they couldn't weed. Holy moly, 31 years? I thought that was three years. Yeah, um, I actually worked for a library district um, who did not have a great weeding policy, and I was a shelver. And I just basically pushed the cart around because there was literally no place to put the books. It was, it was kind of unfortunate. Um, yeah, these are great. I'm loving all of these ideas. Making staff feel empowered. Yeah, Christine was saying that she has no problem weeding. It's getting staff on board. Yes, but I like I like some of these ideas in terms of um, putting it from a customer service point of view that they deserved kind of to have an updated collection, um, and that stores have to go through this too. Excellent. Well, at the end of today's session, I will gather um, these ideas and make sure that they get posted. Um, we'll give just another second or two for the, for the last few to post, and then we'll go back to the slides. Thanks, guys. That's great. Yeah, these are all fabulous ideas. We especially like, you know, we like to hear people wanting to hear from shelvers or library aides, you know, making sure there's more people involved than just the maybe the one point person because it has to be something where everybody's on board. So thanks, everybody, for sharing your ideas. We really, uh, it's great to see how many great ideas there are out there. So um, I know I saw some people out there using Musty and Crew. We use kind of our own thing that we call the three U's. So the first one has is has the item been used? So our uh, board of library directors set up a cost per circulation goal, kind of looking at how things circulated, how much they cost, and looking at what other libraries were using around the city as well as other urban libraries. And this was the goal that they came up with, was $3.45 per circulation. And so what that means is CDs and DVDs, five circulations, books need about six circulations, so on and so forth. Um, and while we don't like weed books when they get to this point initially, sometimes it helps you feel better. So you get a brand new Disney travel guide, it takes a tumble down splash mountain and it is no longer useful. It's water damaged, it's gross, and you don't want to reshelve it. You can at least feel better knowing that it lived its best life and we have plenty of books that get far beyond this in circulations. And that is circs per year, yeah. So the second of the three U's, is it useful? Is it current? And does it meet supply and demand? Um, so we have this wonderful copy of So You Want to Be a Rock Star. It was added in 1985, but published in 1976. And with the advent of social media, I'm going to imagine that being a rock star is very different than it once was. Um, so uh, when you're finding your books, marketing on MySpace, Windows XP, we found birds of the USSR not all that long ago. The Atkins diet. 
Well, presumably the birds haven't changed. The USSR doesn't exist anymore, so that's something. Um, I found one the other day that was just called Biography Today, and it had Christina Aguilera on the cover. I'm sure some of you remember her. And then are your customers getting good use from it? So just because they took it home, was it actually beneficial to them? Or did, did they learn about Christina Aguilera and realize that no one else was learning about her any longer? And then the last of our U's is So then our supply and demand was the other thing. So who is asking for the item? Are we keeping it one for one customer? A lot of our branches used to carry stamp catalogs, but they didn't circulate widely. We had one person using them system-wide, and they're quite expensive. So is it worth us having 12 sets of stamp catalogs for one guy? We are used serving our communities with limited budget, space, time, and resources. Um, and for many titles, we can access, access them through Prospector or Interlibrary Loan. Um, and some of you might use other systems for that for, through your consortium. And then our last of the three U's, is it usable? So a lot of you shared that you take a customer's eye view. Um, so we like to think that these are the things that are the first impression and the face of the library. Having nice looking items encourages others to treat them well. Um, and even if a book is well used and still circulating, if it's worn out, worn out and damaged, it needs to go. It's been well loved and it's okay to let those go. Um, I also have a note here that says, if the case for a CD doubles as a shank, please weed it. Um, so we like to ask, would you take this book to bed with you? So books with water damage, you can see that one example um, can lead to mold. And also, it may not be water. We try to avoid playing Guess the Brown Spot. Um, I listened to a past CSL in session where they showed a book that was covered in something brown, a children's dictionary um, that was new. And people were speculating, well, it could be coffee. It could be chocolate. I'm sure it's safe. And someone said, well, if you knew it was blood, would you treat that book the same way? Um, books that have broken spines, have pages falling out. As it turns out, customers want all the pages in their books. And then defaced, written on, or colored pages. They also want their pages without the commentary of others. We had someone correct all of the accents in an Isabella Allende book recently that we had to weed because of it. So next up, we have a couple of slides that we are going to um, play a little game of sorts that is called Would You Weed It? So I have a fantastic Adventures of Tin Tin Volume 6. And you can see the wrinkled pages and sort of greasy spot in the spine. I will also let you all know that this book um, smelled delightful. It definitely had a run-in with some lavender essential oil. <laughs> see a lot of weeds coming in. Nobody is keeping this one. <laughs> <laughs> Lavender is not essential to most reading experiences, I imagine. <laughs> For some of you, maybe. Yeah, consider replacement based on Cirque. <laughs> It'll put you to sleep. The lavender, hopefully, maybe not the book. <laughs> <laughs> if it's considered valuable, can we replace it? That is challenging, and sometimes you can find newer replacements, and especially for art books, which have limited print runs and can be pretty expensive, that can be a challenge. But then also, if the book is really gross and people don't want to touch it, or it's missing pages of the art, that can be a pretty fine line.
good copy from another library system. Well, let's move on to our next one. Um, I see that someone wants to discuss management of sets, and maybe we can. Oh, Becker is typing a response to that. So, our next one. Would you read it? This is a book called "You Will Know Me," um, and you can see that it has some water damage on sort of the back quarter. A lot of weeds. I see one I might not. Would number of circs matter here? Hmm. Uh, this one does have, uh, it's circulated five times this year, 24 times in its lifetime. It was added in 2016. And we have 17 active copies of it with three checked out. It last circulated September 24th. <laughs> Got our money's worth, yeah. Since it's such low circs. Okay. I wouldn't take this to bed. Always a good measure. So it looks like this one is a weed vote as well. So we're going to move on to The Hunted by Matt de la Pena. So this one had a bit of a some, some tearing on the pages in the middle. This one had 12 circulations this year, um, and we have four copies. When you can't, um, what you can't see here is this copy is actually relatively new. It must have been a replacement copy, so the cover is shiny and bright, and all the pages are clean. I feel like this has been the one that we've been most on the fence about as a group. And I'm going to be honest, this was actually only two or three pages that were wrinkled, so we, gone, we straightened them back out. and sent it back into the world because I knew that it wouldn't, it'll only live so long anyway as a young adult book. The 12 sticks I don't consider this new, just shiny. That's <laughs> definitely true for some, yes, for some books.
This one is a young adult book. So I have one more book that you guys for us to look at, um, Night School by Lee Child, one of the uh, Jack Reacher books. So this one you can see has a pretty nice looking book block, but also a broken spine. I see lots of repairs and lots of men's. And I like Stacy's comment about um, if you have the time and resources also. So that's another thing to keep in mind. It's a great idea. So you see Susan also said that So it looks like this one is a mend mend if you have time and if not out it goes. Yeah. We don't do a lot of repairs at DPL because we often have a lot of copies except for those rare books that we were kind of talking about before, ones that are harder to get or that were very expensive in the first place. All right, so um, there you all got to practice exercising your informed judgment, which I'm betting that you do a lot of since it seems like we have a lot of weeders in the room. But one of the things we've learned at Denver Public Library is that can be a double-edged sword. Um, so building in checks that allow people of all staff levels to get involved, but everyone else is maybe not your, everyone is not necessarily a final decision maker. Um, one of our branches has a cart that's called the Weedatorium, which is where they put all of their items they suspect may need weeding. Um, at the branch where I work, Park Hill, um, everyone is empowered to pull the trigger. So if they find a book that they find gross or that they wouldn't take to bed personally, then we empower them to weed weed the book, but they are, there's also plenty of people to ask for help. Um, so you're never you're never weeding all alone. And it's sort of a balance between following the empowerment of being able to do it and feeling like you can, but then also following those standards because we don't want someone deleting all of our new Harry Potter books because we have too many. Um, and then always having someone that you can go to for a second opinion. You also though have to be careful not to pass the buck. You can see this book here that's on the page called Five Smooth Stones, um, which has quite a bit of water damage and the cover looks like it's gone through the ringer. And it has a note on the front that says, this may be needed to be weeded. So then scalability, uh, we started in the beginning and we talked a little bit about the size of branches and size of collections and districts and how that impacts um, your weeding. So the, the uh, information that we put together was something that each of our branches could use no matter their size. So the branch on the left of the slide is our central branch library, which is 504,000 square feet. And then Decker, the one on the right, um, is a Carnegie library built in 1913, and it is 4,932 square feet. So tiny in comparison. And at the Central Branch Library, there are 371,900 items on the shelf versus just under 12,000 at Decker. So the branch on the right has 3.2% of what is in the larger branch on the left. So um, there is a, a, play, a template on the left that has um, the start of a collection maintenance draft plan. 
um, that you can download or just write on scratch paper. And we're going to give you guys a few minutes to start work on your collection maintenance plan just to get some ideas out there and written down. So if people if want wanna, to download, I'm sorry, if people want to download the file. If you want to ask any more questions in the chat or save any of your weeding tips, this would be a great time to do that as well. And for those who um, would like to download the, um, the template, um, it, uh, if you just click on where it says draft a CM plan, um, it is a fillable PDF that will open or will allow you to download. Um, otherwise, um, you can think about things like um, what is the current state of your kind of weeding process, where might, you know, what's working well, what needs to be improved, um, what are some goals that you might have for weeding, what staff need to be involved, training, and those kinds of things. Once again, the template will be available um, at the end of the session as well. So we're just going to give you just a minute or two just to think about where you might want to start, and then um, you, you can follow up and finish it later. And I think maybe we can do maybe just two more minutes, um, because we want to make sure to get through the content, and that way people can come back and revisit it. Does that sound good, guys? And for those of you who um, maybe aren't in a place where you can download the file, but you have other questions for the presenters, we can use this time for those questions too before we continue. So feel free to enter any questions or um, thoughts you might have in the chat area. So Jamie has a question about balancing between large and small libraries. Um, do you allow staff to relocate materials between libraries? And if so, um, do you guys have any guidelines for that? Historically, we had a system that was called too much, too little, um, in which branches could say, I have too many of a certain collection. And another branch could say, oh, I have space for that. And they would take um, items from each other. And we just maintained that in a Google Drive um, spreadsheet. But uh, we recently started something um, that's available through our ILS um, that's called load balancing, in which each of the branches measured their shelves and kind of figured out how much space they had for each collection. And then our ILS manages which branches have space for certain collections and then does the work to reallocate them to the collection or to the branch that has the most space. Um, we do allow branches also, though, we often will just communicate with each other by email or we maintain a spreadsheet that says which branches have space so that we can send books to other branches if things are getting too full. Emphasize that uh, conditional weeding was very important. Don't send something to another branch instead of conditionally weeding it. Um, so there were a lot of conversations around that when uh, t the redistribution was started. Uh, it's been going well so far. Uh, we've been sort of figuring out which collections are too full, which ones the average is kind of funny with, like our beginning readers have been filling up. 
Um, Polaris is the ILS that we use. Um, so it's, it's required a little bit of troubleshooting, seeing uh, when things do get too full, figuring out what, how that happened. Is the shelf measurement incorrect? Is the average size that we have for those books a little funny, or they're not actually that average size? The setup was very time intensive, yeah. It's been good now. So we're going to move on to the next slide so we don't run out of time, but Becker's going to keep answering some questions in the chat. So communication, um, as Becker had mentioned, we started as an interdepartmental team in 2013 with representatives from each of our 26 locations, um, kind of as a response to floating and finding all of these strange or yucky books that weren't a good fit for our collection any longer. Um, representatives, representatives can come from any role in a branch with supervisor approval, and they're expected to go back to their branch and share what they learn um, from meetings to the staff at their location. Work on our collection maintenance team provides an opportunity for leadership for those who might not have that opportunity otherwise. And then our meeting notes are di digested and then sent out to all of the managers and sort of stakeholders around the system. Our meetings were once by month or were once monthly and we've sort of reduced those uh, that we now meet quarterly as we've had less and less to talk about as our collection has been better weeded um, and we can do a lot of our communication through Google Drive and other avenues these days. Um, we did find that we did still need our in-person meetings though to work out finer points like should we keep buying children's CDs, um, specific non-conditional weeding guidelines for our medical and technology collections with our books and borrowing department who oversees the largest part of our circulating collection. And then uh, Google Groups allows us to be in contact with key people and get information to those who need it even when we're not together. And then last of all, it doesn't have to be high tech. Um, so the pictures that are here are the ways that we weed at my branch. We have a whiteboard for writing down when things are full. And then we keep a log of what we've weeded for our monthly assignments, just a paper log that we keep in a folder. So the way that we actually started in the very beginning was with an annual calendar that was created by collection development and that was our jumping off point to put us all on the same page. This is so all of the branches can be weeding the same areas at the same time. We have instructions for specific areas of the library so we have a, a form that corresponds with each month. Um, so in January that might say our zero hundreds um, what makes a zero hundred outdated, how long we would keep them, what the oldest one should be like, or things to look for. And then do-it-yourself reports. Um, so our ILS Polaris has a reporting software called Simply Reports that we use to get data. So those items that are have a lot of circulations or are not circulating well um, tells us how those if those items are used and then can also help us evaluate if they're usable. If something has circled 300 times, there's a good chance that it is no longer in good shape. And then there'll be examples of all of that that'll be on the CSL in session site. And then documentation continued. Who does what? Um, so we've outlined the roles of the people and the groups across the organization so all staff could make contact through the proper channels and it's something that we share out at our collection maintenance 101 training that we teach probably about quarterly across the system especially for for new staff and then we have a group of four of us that are called the collection maintenance buddies um, where we answer questions and help people kind of be on the right track um, and figure out what to do with certain items or certain collections. Um, we streamlined by standardizing communication. So we have forms and processes for sending items for repairs um, or for cataloging issues. Uh, they used to get a lot of sticky notes that just said this is wrong, which as it turns out was not helpful. And so now we um, have ways to get those items to the right place. And then as I mentioned, we use our Google Groups and our Google Drive um, which allow for easy sharing 
virtual comments, and keeping things up to date. And then it's the destination, not the journey. Um, so while we make small changes and updates, our nuts and bolts stay pretty much the same. Through three years or so, there's been a lot of trial and error, and this is where we've ended up. But it's a process that's consistently evolving. So uh, hopefully a lot of you work in places where you are not the only person doing the collection maintenance. Um, is there anybody here who is the only person doing collection maintenance or people who don't have a whole lot of help? Uh, weeding is something we talk to with the whole staff. Um, and we try to make sure it's part of shelver training all the way up to librarian training. And we're even trying to make sure that managers and people who don't deal with the public and the collection that often at least know what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. Um, so new hires are strongly encouraged to go to our Collection Maintenance 101 training. It's also available as a slideshow if they can't get to an in-person training right away. Um, because we really want to emphasize that this is something that is part of our culture here at Denver Public Library. We want to make sure the collection looks wonderful for everybody. Um, but it's also an ongoing process, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, we, we send out periodic reminders. Um, we talk about specific areas of the collection when they come up in the, the weeding schedule. And we make sure that people understand that some areas really do need extra special attention. <laughs> so. so our books and borrowing department at Central has uh, a department of 50 people and they circulate only the adult materials and they have uh, what we call the long tail of the collection some of the older items that maybe circ once every two or three years when our smaller branches if they have a book that hasn't circulated in three years we would expect that to be not part of their collection um, and they often have very small staff so we try to emphasize that while they're two very different buildings, it's all part of the same collection. And people are able to ask and answer questions across the system. I think it's the robust communication that really, really helps. Some of our smaller libraries, they're maintaining the popular collections and you know those those board books and those picture books they get worn out really fast and we expect that to happen um, but with a staff of you know three or five or seven sometimes the weeding doesn't happen as quickly as it should um, but with our with our system we are trying to make sure every, everybody feels empowered and everybody's aligned <laughs> um, we're also, we also encourage folks to experiment in our collection maintenance, um, you know, play around with the report functions of Polaris and see what kind of information they can pull out, see what might be useful. Uh, everybody needs to support each other's efforts if one branch is weeding and another isn't and things are going back and forth between them. It's just, it's very frustrating. Um, so we try to remind everybody that it's not just collection maintenance, it is customer service is what we're all trying to do here. <laughs> um, let's see. So staff alignment equals staff empowerment. Um, we're trying to create a culture that's not just what we like to call anecdata. Um, <laughs> We're trying to track things and make sure that we can measure our success. Um, we've recently sent out reports to all the branches uh, stating how much of their um, whole collection is dusty. Um, so it's interesting to be able to see, you know, some branches are doing really well, some branches aren't. 
Um, but we've given people goals for 2019 to try to work on that number from wherever they are. No matter, no matter where they are, there's some room for improvement. Um, libraries are definitely increasingly data driven, so we're trying to make sure that we have those reports for our uh, library commission and for our managers to make sure that they know that we are doing the best we can to, to, get, uh, to get our collection in the best shape possible. Um, so this last one here, this is just, uh, this is our Sam Gary branch, which is a, a newer branch for Denver Public Library. When it first opened, um, there was a vision that the adult fiction and the children's fiction would be together and that the families would browse together um, and that everybody would be happy. But after they were open for a couple years, they realized that that was not how they were using the library. Um, so they instead of just changing everything right away, they did a, a whole year of data collection um, to figure out what the ideal sizes of each of their collections would be. And we moved around everything. Um, I personally moved all the fiction in that library uh, from one side of the library to the other. Um, so it is possible to make gigantic changes when you have the data to back it up. Um, and when you have the staff and manager buy-in. Um, it's a lot of work, but it is, it is definitely possible. And it's made a difference for that library. Their new books are more featured. Um, their children's section was not big enough, and now it is, it is grown. And their, their uh, circulation for picture books is even bigger than it used to be. So it is possible to, to use weeding and data to, to make things better. <laughs> So I think that about wraps things up. I think we still have some questions coming in. Um, if people have more questions, please feel free to ask in the chat, and we are we are happy to to share all of our information. Um, yeah, do feel free to continue adding questions in the chat box, and there's a couple that I'm going to circle back to. But also, we're just kind of curious out of today's session, maybe what is one thing that you can take back and share with your organization um, to see maybe if you can start changing the culture um, at your organization a little bit, especially around weeding, if necessary. Um, some other people may have excellent processes in place. But if you um, would like to share um, kind of what your aha moments were from today's session in the chat box. Um, and then revisiting some of the questions I saw come through, there was a question earlier about um, cookbooks. Do you guys have any special procedures for cookbooks? Um, maybe if maybe one or two pages are stained. Uh, so to answer the question about cookbooks, I've kind of been thinking about it since I saw it roll through. It can be really challenging, so I would say, like, what does the rest of the cookbook look like? Keeping that in mind again, while well, most of us are not taking our cookbooks to bed, maybe some people are, um, is this something I would still feel comfortable taking to bed? How is it impacting the rest of the book? Does it circulate well? How many circulations has it had? Can we replace it? Um, so I think I would take a lot of things into consideration. Um, if those two pages are completely greasy or sticky and I just don't feel comfortable touching them, I'm still going to weed it, even if it's only two of them. But if they have a couple of flecks on them and I feel comfortable still using that book and I would take it to bed, then I might hold on to it. And I think we've seen a couple questions about what to do with um, series or sets, maybe where you need to weed one of them. Do you have to go back and find another one? Um, uh, and I think Becker is kind of starting to answer the series question. But um, I think that's where some people get sort of stuck, is you sort of feel like you need to have the whole 
don't think we have to have the whole series because usually somebody will be able to fill in that hole, whether it's, you know, the next town over or seven states over. Um, and it's valuable real estate. So it's, if it's a series that doesn't circulate well at your location, you know, keep the first two or three that circulate well. And if people want to continue with that series, um, you know, use the wonderful resources of interlibrary loan. And then if, you know, if that person chalks up those books in your community and all of a sudden you get a lot of demand, um, then maybe you can get the whole series. But don't don't uh, get the shelves full of things that aren't going to circulate. <laughs> and Christine earlier had a question about what is the difference between weeding um, a floating collection versus weeding for a system maybe that doesn't have a floating collection, if there is any. Um, so Becca commented on that in the chat that mostly it's local control with the floating collection versus the uh... so with the floating you have to consider the whole system how many copies overall does it circulate well in one place but maybe not another and it can be re relocated um, so then we also have so really it's just about who's controlling which piece of the collection do you actually own your collection it lives in your branch you know it you love it and you see how it's used versus with the floating collection, our books come and go. So they might not, they might not live only here. Um, we also have something called the 1020 rule that we use for that. So if we own 20 or more copies of a book and 10 or, 10 or less are checked out, we might weed those purely on usage just because system wide, they're not getting enough usage to justify owning that many copies. So I think I caught most of the questions um, from earlier, but if I missed it, feel free to re-put it in the um, 